afternoon and welcome to another episode of Yala Y'all, conversations with activists working on the front lines for Palestinian and Black liberation. And for those who are not familiar with the series or who have just come on board, I would like to first explain the purpose of the series and why we're doing this. Um, the purpose of yep. Yala Y'all conversations is to highlight those activists who have been working consistently for the effective and complete liberation of Palestinian and Black people globally. Some of our guests are very well-known activists in the racial justice movements that include Palestinian and Black liberation, but many are not well-known, as well-known, but have been working on the front lines for the rights of Black and Palestinian people for decades. Also, as our guests will be sharing their stories as to how they became activists, we want to impress upon our audiences that one does not have to be famous or have any special credentials to become an activist. Most people become activists because they see something that is wrong and they want to bring some awareness and help correct the situation. So in other words, activists are ordinary people who have become involved in doing some extraordinary things in the name of justice and peace. So with that, we all can become activists. And so I would like to introduce our guest. Mariam El Khatib is a Palestinian American living in Minnesota. And during college, she was a member of Students for Justice in Palestine at the University of Minnesota, where she helped pass divestment on campus. She is currently an active member of the Minnesota chapter, chapter of American Muslims for Palestine. Miriam is passionate, first and foremost, about educating her community on the issue of Palestine and social justice to empower and inspire them to mobilize and work towards liberation. Miriam draws from her experience living under Israeli occupation and seeing the challenges that her family and her community has faced under Israeli aggression. So salam and welcome, Miriam. How are you today? Wa alaikum as -salam. I am well. Thank you for having me, Felicia. Good. Well, I, let's first begin um, with the fact that you have lived in Pal under the occupied territories and what that was like, what, how long ago was it, and how, what that was like for you and your family? Sure, yeah, I lived in Palestine between the years 2000 and 2002. I was five years old when my family decided to move back. They wanted to raise their kids in the homeland around our family. Uh, we didn't have anyone in, in the U.S., um, so they sold everything off here in the U.S. and, and actually moved us back to Palestine. Um, and you know, living there, when you're living it there, it, I mean, it's your normal life, right? Like that is your life. And especially as a child, you know nothing else. And it really wasn't until years later that I reflected back and I was like, that wasn't normal. Um, and no. so some of those things that I experienced was uh, checkpoints, going to school. I went through three checkpoints on my bus, um, soldiers coming onto the bus and searching the bus uh, was, a, was a normal occurrence. Uh, there was one point, um, actually during that time, if, if, if uh, folks are familiar with the timeline between 2000 and 2002 of course the intifada happened the second intifada and so it was a time of lots of tension lots of closures curfews so we lived through all of that you know the curfews um the checkpoints the blockades not being able to go to certain so at some point they actually blocked my street so my bus couldn't reach me and so i ended up having to live at my uncle's house for two weeks so that i could be picked up by the bus and be able to go to school Another time, my dad actually um, <laughs> broke the curfew, and he was uh, out in the street. He heard the sound of the, you know, the Israeli jeep coming, and so he ended up running and and broke his legs, leg. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, ended up in a cast. So these types of things. I mean, I, I remember also my dad. There was one situation in which he got stopped by a checkpoint, and my sister, who was I think in preschool or daycare at the time, had left her backpack in the car. And the soldiers suspected that it might have a bomb or something like that. And so they made him stand at the checkpoint in front of all the lined up cars and take item by item out of the bag until they could clear him. So it was these types of situations that, you know, over there, unfortunately, it was normal at that time. And it's normal today because that's part of day delay. But it really isn't normal and it shouldn't be normal. Um, but that was that was my experience living there. I've since visited multiple times. And of course, you know, uh, since then, the wall has gone up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remember the apartheid wall. Um, you know, it, it, it's so interesting because when I was SJP on campus, right, we we did the mock wall as part of Israeli apartheid week. And you memorize all these facts and you can like mm -hmm. spit out like it's 26 feet high, 400 miles. But you don't really understand what that means until you're standing in front of the wall. And I just remember the first time I saw it and I was like, oh, my God, it is so big, like 26 feet 
eye of concrete like you just cannot imagine that until you're and so you know the, the the checkpoints i once counted it took me seven checkpoints to get from outside of jerusalem to uh, the al-aqsa mosque and at every checkpoint you had to take out your id you know show them and you know this is me speaking from the privilege of a u.s citizen right this wow. is like i i i, I over there, I have the privilege of being a U.S. citizen, of being on a visa. So even when I was living, I was actually there for, for um, on a visa. And so, you know, we, we, we get to experience some of the occupation, but it's even worse for, for those who are Palestinians with, who carry Palestinian IDs. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, it, people in the United States can't imagine what it's like to do that. I visited um, the territories back in 2008 and we went through Kalandia uh, checkpoint and I was scared to death. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you, you go through and you've got people pointing guns at you and oftentimes making fun of you while they're, you know, they're laughing and joking. And these are young Israeli soldiers who are, you know, half my age, at least <laughs> most of them. And it's just, it's terrifying. So I can't imagine as a young person, as a, as a five-year-old, a very young person having to um, go through that existence. And, um, and it's really hard to explain. When you talk to people here in the United States, how do, they, how, it, how do you explain it to them? So like I said, I think for a while, I just didn't realize that that was a weird thing, right? Like, so I, I mean, it was just, it, that's what life was in Palestine. And it wasn't until I would say these things like, what, what, like a checkpoint? Like, what's a checkpoint, right? Um, and so I think the reactions were, you know, those of bewilderment of like, really, that's what that, that's what you have to go through um, when you're living there. I think, and, and this is an unfortunate fact, but more recently, I think people are becoming more familiar with some of the tactics mm -hmm. that we work in, in uh, that we experience in Palestine. And so... Um, I, I remember when here in, in Minneapolis, when I, I smelled the tear gas and I was like, oh my God, this is last time I smelled this was in Palestine. And I think now, you know, unfortunately in a lot of cities, people know what tear gas smells like yeah. and they know what a curfew is like. And they know, you know, th th they're familiar with this, um, you know, the, the, un the indiscriminate killing of people mm -hmm. in the street. Right. And so I think, um, people are becoming more attuned to other struggles because of the unfortunate mm -hmm. parallels between these systems. Absolutely. I want to put a pin in that. I want to get go back to your experience at having lived in, in Minnesota during um, the incident with George Floyd. But um, before we go to that, you began your activism as a student and part of students um, working for justice in Palestine. And you all were successful in uh, getting the University of Minnesota to divest. And this is, for those who aren't familiar, this is part of a strategy that um, civil society, uh, Palestinian civil society called upon in 2005, I believe, um, to, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And it's, it's based on some of the tactics and strategies that was used in apartheid South Africa in terms of getting um, U.S. companies and institutions and corporations and eventually the government to divest from um, Israel. Um, and the goal is really to uh, unlock the complicitness um, from the U.S. in terms of the money that we've been sending over to Israel uh, on, a, on a yearly basis or you know, over the last few years. Um, because that's our tax dollars. So could you explain um, your experience with that and, and working with Students for Justice in Palestine? Yeah, sure. Uh, before I do that though, I do wanna mention something. People will ask me before introducing me like, oh, when did you start your activism? And uh, one thing I wanna say, and I, I, I'm sure a lot of activists feel like this and Felicia, you as well, is that for many of us, those of us who identify as Palestinian or if you're black in America, there isn't really, you're born into this, right? Like this is your identity. Um, so there isn't really a point where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna be an activist, um, right? You know, there's, there's you know, activism that you can be involved in, organizations, work, right? But even, you know, and this is one of my favorite, favorite um, sayings is existence is resistance, right? Yes. Being a Palestinian, yes. identifying yes. as a Palestinian, is my resistance and has been my resistance. I was also fortunate enough to be raised in a family where, you know, again, activism was kind of part of being Palestinian. My dad was part of the Holy Land 
uh, foundation. Oh. Um, he managed the Ramallah office. That's actually also part of why yeah. we moved. Right. And so that's just kind of always been my experience of being a Palestinian, that if I were to be Palestinian, I need to always be, you know, active in that, actively Palestinian. So, you know, when I went to campus, it was only natural that I joined the Students for Justice in Palestine organization, um, just for everyone's sake. Uh, SJP has chapters all over the country on campuses in the U.S., I think over, over a couple, you know, couple hundred at this point. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as Felicia mentioned, we did a divestment campaign in 2016. This was based on a divestment campaign on other campuses. This was kind of becoming the common tool, the common tactic that many SJPs were taking up to get their universities to divest. And so what we did is we brought a resolution to our student government. We did a campaign. We organized. And we, you know, we ended up facing a lot of backlash. And actually, the student organization Students Supporting Israel, which is kind of Almost like as the parallel of SJP actually started at the University of Minnesota campus. Um, so we had a lot of pushback. We had a lot of pushback. Uh, we had to talk to administration. You know, we had, we faced, um, we even faced uh, um, f like fear mongering. Uh, the other side was actually running Facebook ads with faces of members who were part of the campaign mm -hmm. saying like, do you know that Maryam al-Khatib supports terrorism? And it would, they would like link it in a weird way to a, a page I had liked on Facebook. And they were running these ads to students on campus. I mean, it was, it was actually really scary. I remember having to go to the campus security and they're like, you know, there isn't really much we can do. We can walk you <laughs> like, <laughs> right, wherever you need to go. Um, but, you know, we, we, we and with a lot of these things, it's really, you know, the group that you have, you draw inspiration and strength from the people that you're working with. And so we stuck together and we had a lot of support. We had a lot of support from our community. We had a lot of support from organizations like Palestine Legal and AMP. Like, I mean, everyone really wanted it to pass, just like we had wanted it to pass on every single campus that tried to pass divestment. And I just remember the hearing and um, what ended up happening is actually really interesting is one of, after all this lobbying, um, one of the student representatives, representatives got up and actually made a motion to get it off the agenda after we spent so long to like lobby them. And the motion passed because the way the student representative saw it is that it had caused so much division that it was better to just like not talk about it. And so that was really defeating and deflating, but we ended up bringing it back and it ended up getting watered down. Of course, they took out, like they didn't want to be, you know, doing singling out Israel and we ended up having to add a bunch of things, but it passed. And for us, we still considered that a victory. It helped strengthen our coalition. We ended up building a lot of amazing um, uh, relationships with other organizations on campus. And that set it, us, set it up for us to pass divestment again two years later. And so I wasn't there at the time, um, but uh, I know my sister was. And that time they decided, okay, you know what? Our student government isn't really doing anything we're going to pass it through a referendum. We're going to get the students to vote. And so same thing. They ran, you know, another divestment campaign and they got, you know, again, we they faced challenges. They faced Facebook uh, pushback. The opposition literally were bribing people with cookies to vote. <laughs> <laughs> and it still passed. It's absolutely incredible. And the, you know what's, what's amazing to me, Felicia, is like these, these passing of divestments are like symbolic. I mean, they yeah. really don't. Like they don't, they're not binding in any way. Um, but the Zionist movement feels so threatened by it. Yes. And it shows yes. by how much they fight against it. Our president, President Kaler, our previous president of the University of Campus, spoke out against a resolution the first time we tried to pass it. He put out a statement against it. He, he would never ever comment on any student government issues. And he felt so compelled to speak out against, you know, this, this resolution being introduced by, you know, little old SJP. And he spoke out actually ultimately between the two divestment campaigns. He putting, ended up putting out, I think, three statements against wow. this resolution. And that shows you the number of pressure. And what we later found out is there was actually a letter sent to, I believe, either our board of directors, I can't remember, the, our board of directors or the president or both that had 80 state legislators wow. onto it, basically threatening him with threatening the university with funding if they did not, um, you know, try to basically stop this. And wow. what's scary is since since I left campus, you know, we have the recent uh, we had the executive order by the, uh, the mm -hmm. by, you know President Trump to mm -hmm. change the definition of anti-Semitism. You know, you, we heard what Pompeo said the other day about what anti-Semitism is and what it means and basically to include that criticism of Israel. So since I left campus, there's been even more uh, steps taken to basically 
chill uh, speech on campus, and it, it's really scary. You know, it, it's really, really scary. It makes me uh, wonder what what more they will try to do for other students trying to pass campaigns like this. I mean, that just goes to show you how ingrained, like racism, how ingrained Zionism is in the institutional structure of this country that, I mean, it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't, it wasn't a piece of legislation. It was just a resolution. It wasn't going to really change much of anything at all, but they felt so threatened by this. And, you know, when we, when we, you know, kind of looping this back to the types of uh, organizing that we saw on campuses back in the 60s with the Black Power Movement. I mean, this just goes to show that it takes, you know, change doesn't come, you know, overnight. It takes a lot of hard work, um, but you have to stay steadfast and strong and 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 keep the faith that things will will change and. I mean, we haven't changed, you know, everything the way we would like it to be changed. But um, the BDS movement has has been a ripple effect throughout the United States. I mean, even to the point that probably, as you know, Miriam, that um, a lot of governments have have uh, told different mayors and governors not to, you know, to sign uh, these sort of. I, I would, they're kind of like NDAs on on BDS, you know, uh, not to support uh, BDS. So, I mean, that just tells me that whatever we're doing and whatever SJPs are doing and the people who have been working in the BDS movement, it's working because they feel scared and they're threatened. And so you all are to be congratulated on the, on the stellar work that all the SJPs have done over the years, because we've been watching, I was with the US campaign to, at that time it was the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Now it's the US campaign for Palestinian rights. And we were, you know, helping folks to try to give um, tools to help in terms of, of running those campaigns. So um, we were really pleased when things, you know, there was, seemed like there was these, um, like a like a domino effect with all the different SJPs as they as they moved along. So you all are to be congratulated yeah. on that. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a team effort, right? And it's just incredible to see how you know. I mean, like you, you mentioned, it two thousand five is when BDS uh, was called on by Palestinian society, and you know, what are we fifteen years later, uh, right? I mean, that's that's a long time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so and and we still have a long way to go. But at the same time, like you said, it's just absolutely incredible to see the snowball effect. I actually remember uh, talking to my family overseas about BDS, and they'll be like, "Wow, you know what's BDS?" Right? Like they would, they like because for them they have their own, you know, the other like boycott movements. They use different terminology, and I would have to explain to them what divestment was and what we were doing on campus because they'd see me posting about Palestine in Minnesota, right? And now everyone knows what BDS yeah. is. I mean, you know, and, and, and I mean, we can give some credit to to the the haters and the Zionists right Absolutely. for helping with that. Um, yeah, and then the other thing I was I was gonna say is you know some people sometimes people will question like the effectiveness of BDS and is BDS you know hurting and I was like literally just just look at how much is being fought and that in of itself is enough evidence that it's working. If it wasn't working, they wouldn't be spending this much time fighting it. And so that for me like is you know BDS of course is a tool. We all agree it's not the the you know the only thing that we're going to work with, but it's definitely such a powerful tool especially for those of us who are living in places like the US, right? Yeah. Where theoretically speaking, we have the right to boycott, <laughs> right? And we're not physically there in Palestine. Um, you know, B BDS has become really a, a rallying point for a lot of organizations. It's something that we can agree on. It's something that we can work towards. And you're right. It's it's being fought even at a state level. Here in Minnesota, we have an anti-BDS law that passed in 2017 wow. that we're actually currently trying to get repealed as well. So, um, you know, technically speaking, under Minnesota law, the state can't contract with me because I <laughs> publicly support, you know, BDS and the boycotting of Israel. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, fight that's gotten into the state legislators, legislatures. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> in interesting times right now. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, you have been, you are in Minnesota and um, unfortunately you uh, witnessed some of the first protests that happened as a result of the murder of George Floyd. 
And as we know, um, leading the incident that led up to that into uh, uh, former officer Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd, um, the incident began in a corner store that was owned by an Arab American. And although he was not the person who, who called the police um, when it happened and, and, and Mr. Floyd was, was killed, he felt compelled to um, make a statement that he condemned you know, the murder. And you know, I think for me as an African-American, I think you know, that was a, a, a sign of solidarity right there, um, showing that, you know, I mean, just in general, it was, it was wrong to begin with. But I think because of the tensions that have often been between the Black community and the Arab American community, um, I, I feel like maybe he felt a little bit more compelled, more so than to, to, you know, to say what he said. And so I wanted to kind of get your take on that. And also, you know, you did a lot of organizing. You helped with the organizing during that time. And so could you just also, you know, give us, explain to us and tell us your experiences uh, that happened back then. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I can just start with this overall, I think just setting kind of the, the how, how things happened. I remember, you know, it's, I think what happened with George Floyd is gonna be one of those things that you'll always remember where you were when you first heard it or when you first watched the video, um, if, if you were able to watch the video. And um, I, just, I just remember seeing it and I was like, this is un unbelievable. And, and what, we, you know, what we ended up doing is, uh, uh, it was the same day, right? Cause it happened in the evening and then you know, basically the, the, the video and the news got out by the next morning and, and that's when we all went out to the, to the street to protest. With regards to the store owner, I think, you know, and I want to speak more generally here because with, with regards to the specific situation, the, the relationship between that store owner and the community um, is that of, I mean, he was he was in that community, uh, I think, for nearly 30 years. Um, oh. There was, you know, he, he, I don't, you know, personally know that community as much, um, but uh, like you said, he did come out and make a statement and he was cooperating. And I think ultimately um, there was a lot of solidarity uh, from, from, from that community. But I, what I was telling people is like, you know, forget about the specific, cause you know, there's a lot of tension about like, okay, you know, did, did he act in the right way or, but what I think was more important for us to learn from that situation is that there is that tension and there is a problem. There's a problem of, you know, Arab owned businesses in black communities and exploiting the community, but there's also an issue of racism within the Arab community. Right. And, you know, whenever people started talking about the specific situation and trying to defend and, and, you know, I told them, hey, let's step back. Do you know someone who uses, you know, certain language in your circle of friends? If you do, then we have, we still have a problem, right? Regardless if, you know, if everything went right in this situation or, and, you know, nothing was done, it, nothing, it was all, you know, Sorry. Um, regardless of there was, if there was no error from this one mm -hmm. individual, this Arab in this situation, we do have a problem. As as an Arab community, as a Muslim community, we have a racism problem. We have a, a problem, like I said, whether it's through the businesses and the exploitation, or um, just the way anti-racism that we have within our communities. And so, one of the things for me, as as a Palestinian. Uh, and as someone who's part of American Muslims for Palestine, is that we use this opportunity as education. And, um, you know, for me, education is, is core to everything, right? Like you can't mobilize people or you can't mobilize people effectively and sustainably without educating them, right? People, can, you can mobilize them, maybe like get them hyped with some social media and marketing and you know, like protests seem like exciting things to go to. But if you want to mobilize people in an effective way, in a way that's going to be here, you know, long past where you, when you are going to be here, then you need to educate them. And so the first thing that we did was we set up um, a session with our uh, a local imam here, Imam Makram, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He was, uh, he, he's an uh, African-American uh, imam who lives, who leads the masjid that's, that's, that was closest to the George Floyd happening. He's mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Uh, we all love Imam Makram here. And so we set up a, a session with him and our community to hear from him, to understand, you know, uh, you know what is it that what are what is it that black the, the black community faces whether it's within the Muslim community or at the community at large because the Arab community doesn't and especially I think you know the way um, because a lot of our community comes from an immigrant community right like a community that has been 
conditioned and trained to either you know respect the police or or, or mm -hmm. fear the police in a certain mm -hmm. way or even weaponize the police against other people right you know right like we're taught to call the police so you know just understanding a perspective necessarily have um and you know this is not to make this for anyone but um you know the the reality for for a lot of the arabs within the community or immigrants is that they feel like they might lose their citizenship if they don't comply by all the rules if they don't comply by all the laws so even for that like we need to understand how these systems are being used against us to you know put a wedge between us right surveillance i mean surveillance is a huge issue for us right um as 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 muslims Right. And so you always want to make sure you're not doing anything, anything wrong. And so how do we understand these systems and how they're oppressing us in the same way and how sometimes it's being used to turn us against each other? Um, and then also, again, with, you know, just even in, even language that is being used, certain words, how, how we ref, how we refer to people. Um, it, it's there's a lot to be learned. There's a lot of learning that needs to happen within the community and self-reflection. And, you know, that's something that although sometimes we we, we have we rely on the black community to to help us learn i think that's something that i as a palestinian feel like it's my job to educate my community right like you know if if each of us took care of our community then we can get better together as a society right mm -hmm. we can't put that burden on the black community to educate all of us right but if i feel like hey i, ha I have a perspective i was able to see this and you know i always say you know as as a muslim you know, you know like I don't know the things I know because I, you know, I'm special, right? Like, you know, right. God allowed for me to know these things and to have this perspective. So then I see this as a burden and responsibility to make sure my community is educated, that I take that burden off of others that have other things to deal with and make sure that we give them access to that knowledge. Well, I think that you're, you know, what you're saying is very true. Education is the key and that is the purpose and goal of the series that we're running to try to help people understand um, both communities, both the uh, black community in terms of how we've gone about our movements uh, for liberation and both the Arab American, Palestinian American or Palestinian um, and Muslim and Muslim American um, communities and how they've gone, how you all are going through your, your struggle for, um, for liberation and where the, the, do the two um, roads connect. Um, you know, I think, I mean, there's still a lot of education within the black community as well, because, um, even though we particularly in terms of, of the Muslim community, we've had a lot of, of, uh, prominent people who are black, like, like Muhammad Ali and people like that. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, Christianity has done a number on our community as well. And so there is a lot of community, a, a lot of education that needs to happen on both sides. But I, you know, while we're looking at, you know, the two movements together, what do you, what do you see needs to, to happen in terms of um, more cohesiveness, um, better communication or, just both of us understanding that our struggles are so intricately entwined, intertwined. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just so I use an exa a, a specific example, because I felt like I, I didn't, wasn't communicating properly in my last, but like one of the things that happened with George Floyd, right, is, you know, people, for the most part, like, especially the first day, people were outraged, and it was just terrible, and of course, this is wrong. And then the, you know, what they refer to as looting happened, right? And, and the damages to businesses. And just like that, right? So many people were like, oh, this is so bad. Like, look at them. Like, they're just ruining their cut. You know, we were standing with solidarity. Now it's all gut. Like, come on, man. Like, why can't, right? And I was like, you know, and this, I saw this within my own community, right? People like I knew posting on Facebook. Again, you know, a lot of times being, you know, the older generation immigrant. And, you know, and I was like, listen, right? Like, Palestinians, we take pride in the fact that we throw rocks, right? This is, I mean, this is our first intifada. Our first intifada is the revolution of rocks, right? Why? Because it was rocks against bulldozers, right? It was rocks against a, an, an entire army, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you, you can't, you can't uplift and glorify one 
people's resistance and then go and you know uh -huh. try to stifle another people's resistance mm -hmm. right just like we as palestinians you know and unfortunately although you know palestinians you know we, we've been criminalized right we've been made out these terrorists because of the rocks because of the resistance because of the speaking out because of not allowing israel to you know uh, completely destroy us and we've been made out as these terrorists in the media and just like we as palestinians don't want police we want our resistance to be police we don't want our right to resist which is protected under international law to be taken away from us yeah. and we need to understand that other people also are resisting and we need to understand how they're resisting and sometimes our resistance is going to look the same sometimes it's going to be different right um so our, our our you know our struggles are connected but they're not the same there's differences right there's different ways uh we resist there's different ways in how we interact with the, uh, the you know the, the occupation that we're under under the struggle so i think just understanding and, and giving that perspective. And, you know, if there's one good thing that came out of the George Floyd thing is that it helped open up these conversations. And, it, and it's unfortunate, right? Because since George Floyd, there's been, you know, uh, uh, Breonna Taylor and, and multiple others, but you, you know, we thought like George Floyd was it, right? Like, that's it. Like, there's no way we can get past this and not find a solution, but it, we're not, we're not there. We're so far away, right? But it goes back to your older, your your previous point is that it takes time. It takes time. Mm -hmm. Like we really need to continue educating, and I think we need to just be a little bit more um, brave in in what we call for and in our the words and the language that we use. I think sometimes like we're past you know respectability politics. We're mm -hmm. past being like tiptoeing and like you know like no like call it you know just as the I always say like they're so extreme in their injustice. We need to be extreme in our justice. Like we need to be extreme in the things that we can call for, right? If people if some you know if the Zionists can sit down and literally plan the ethnic cleansing of yeah. seven hundred, they literally planned it. I mean they yeah. knew the, the tree, right? If they can if they can believe that they could actually do this. And we can believe that we can bring about justice. Yes, yeah, 70 years later, right? And so, right? So I think we just need to be a little bit more radical and, and believe in, 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 in the fact that things can change and they will change and they've been changing. Um, and I think just working across, you know, exactly what you're doing, Felicia, I think talking and, and, and bringing people together because at the end of the day, we're humans and, you know, the humanity connects us. And so if we can, you know, I don't want to sound so like, you know, like, let's just sit down and talk about it, right? Like, no, like, <laughs> sit down, talk about it, understand. But then also, and this is, you know, a call for all the, le you know, the leaders or the people who are leading organizations or movements is you educate, but then you give them a way to mobilize, right? Like, okay, now, you know, this is where we need you. We need you to show up at this protest. We need you to call your yeah. elected official and do this. We need you to do, you know, and then, you know, get f finding people where they are, right? Mosques, schools, um, you know, it's we can't wait for these bad things to happen for us to have these conversations exactly. and it's really part of our everyday. You know, again, as a as a Muslim, like this is something that you know I'm trying to think about. Like, how do we? How do we? It is it is part of our faith, but it, it's been you know, unfortunately, sometimes the faith is used again to weaponize. Mm -hmm. right? Right? Like, oh, there's no racism in Islam. Yeah, there's no racism in Islam, but there's racism you know within the Muslim community. Um, and so, just thinking about how this can be changed from from, from the you know at its core and not just wait for these events so that we're, we're all reactive that's true i mean i think the last probably five years particularly since um ferguson with mike the, the murder of mike brown it it seems like there's just been one thing right after the other and i think it's been hard for folks to catch up but I think the the George Floyd um, incident was just like, okay, this is it. We can't, you know, I think it just, it was a touchstone in terms of, you know, all of the things that have been building up. Well, I mean, way before Mike Brown, of course, but these last five or six years have been probably the most intense five or six years that we've seen probably since the, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I think people, you know, there was a point where I know as as a black person, you know, I said, this has got to stop. We're tired. You know, we're tired of having to see these things happen. And then we go out in the street and then things, you know, things get a little hot and then it stops, you know, and then, you know, three more months again, it, it starts up again. So I think, um, you know, hopefully this will be a, a time where we can have more sustained 
um, organizing and sustained um, uh, movement making. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your take on what do you see as the future of both of the movements, but organizing and activism in general, and particularly with, with the younger generation? Yeah, I think, and, and you bring up a good point, the younger generation, right? Like, <laughs> this younger generation, man, there's a lot of pressure on them. But I, I really do think that, you know, people, and, you know, maybe not even labeled people who have gone through the recent events, have an experience that will hopefully not only shape their outlook and their activism, but their, their kids and their circles, right? You know, again, I think George Floyd really did happen, it helped open up a lot of conversations. I mean, I saw people posting and I'm sure you feel the same way. Like, you know, they, you wouldn't, you know, they, they were never ever like, and I hate calling it political, right? Like, because it's not a political issue. It's not simply a political issue, but they never have commented about something like this before, you know, comment, right? right? Um, and even for me, like, you know, friends, uh, again, who probably didn't even, have never even thought about Palestine or anything, right? When I post about Palestine, like, they would come, you know, like and interact. And I'm like, okay, Megan, right? Like, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> I think, you know, there's just a, a, a greater awareness and we just need to keep doing the work that we're doing. And, you know, and I think we both acknowledge that, you know, these things tend to flare up whenever there's an action, you know, something that happens in the news, but there's also work that is being done, right? Like there are people who are working day in and day out and, and working towards this. And, you know, they're the ones who are there after the media hype mm -hmm. is gone, after the protests in the street. I mean, right now I know like, you know, uh, we have a group of activists here trying to defund the police in, in Minneapolis and it's been a struggle. I mean, they just approved, the, the Minneapolis council just approved additional funding for the police, right? Like after all of this, wow. they just approved additional funding, right? And so, you know, that being said, I think we're, we're getting better and, and smarter as, as activists. I think we're getting more, um, we're, we're, we're connecting our struggles a little bit better. I mean, Iyad Halla, right? The 30 year old autistic Palestinian man literally got murdered within a few days of yeah. the George Floyd. Same thing. I mean, he was walking in the street. Yeah. Um, he got scared when he heard, you know, saw the soldiers, didn't know how to react. He was, he was, you know, on, on the spectrum and he just got shot and killed. And for me, I mean, that was like, I mean, like it was between George Floyd and Iyad Hayala. It's like, it's, it, they're so similar in so many ways. How can we not work together? How can we not understand? Like, you know, I was telling you about, you know, some of the people, like, we need to be the people who understand the most what Black people are going through in America. Again, mm -hmm. not because every our, our experience is going to be fully the same, but, like, you know, this is this is what we've been trying to fight for over 70 years in, in for Palestine. We, we need to un understand and connect. And I think a lot of us here, especially those of us who were born here, you know, feel like we're, we're, we're part of this country and, and the country, you know, we, we can hold it accountable maybe more than maybe the immigrant community felt. And I think, no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, you know, we're not under that fear of being deported, which is a very valid fear. And I don't want to discount that. Um, right. So I think we're, we're just, we're just, we're a lot more vocal, I think as a, as a, as a, as a movement and, um, we're making progress. I mean, just look at, you know, Palestine now has two bills related to Palestine, you know, uh, within the U.S. Congress. We have a Palestinian. We have, uh, you know, it's just, just things are changing and, and it's really exciting. We just got to keep doing that work and, and really inspire because you never know who you might inspire that will carry that work forward. Um, and that's why, again, I'm so passionate about education. It's just inspire people and they will carry this this, this movement forward. Um, and, you know, for me, I always, you know, think like your oppressor is never going to hand your your freedom to you. Like it's, it's, it's just that's just not how it works. That, <laughs> they're not an oppressor, then, right? Nope, <laughs> so you just got to keep doing that. That was the whole doing. idea behind what uh, Frederick Douglass said, you know. So exactly, exactly. You know. We have to um, demand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's you know, and, and you know, like I said, like for Palestinians, like we have so much to learn from the from the 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 struggle, the black uh, struggle in America. Like it's it's so, uh, you know, it, it's so interesting. And you know, the I, I'm trying to read more and I'm trying to understand more. And it's just like there's so much for us to learn as Palestinians from the black liberation uh, struggle. And I know when, you know, uh, when Ferguson was happening, Palestinians were tweeting to uh, people in Ferguson, like, how do you deal with the tear gas? And how do you, right? So there's a lot for us to learn from, e from each other in our struggles. And, you know, I hope, and I can't wait until we, we both see, see liberation. Absolutely. I mean, like you said there, you know, we as, as black activists 
have as much to to um, to learn as as you all are learning about us. I mean, and we both have histories. I mean, um, the Black Power movement, just as uh, the movement for Black uh, Black Matters, uh, Black Lives Matters, uh, made a statement. There were documents that the uh, Black Panthers made. Um, about working for the liberation of Palestine. So our, there's a history. I mean, it's, it, it just didn't start with Ferguson. There is a history of Black and Palestinian people working together for each other's liberation. So as we're winding down and winding up this session, um, you did mention um, about um, the um, uh, abolishing the police um, and, you know, um, or defunding the police. And just recently, former President Obama made a statement that, you know, activists should stop using that language. And, you know, it's, you know, so, I, you know, as an activist and as a person who's been working on the front lines for both liberations and understanding how, you know, state violence works in terms of that and understanding also that the United States has learned a lot from the Israeli government in terms of how to carry out the types of violence that we've seen incurred upon black people uh, recent, <coughs> excuse me, recently. So what do you think about what President Obama said and, and just, you know, the future of as we are moving into this next administration, which is somewhat of a carryover of the Obama, I, I believe will be a carryover of the Obama administration. What are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, you know, although that statement was disappointing, it's not surprising. And for me, similar to the Mike Pompeo statement on BDS, it was like fuel for me, right? Like, okay, man, like, <laughs> let's bring it on, right? <laughs> um, and I think it shows you how deeply embedded these systems are. Right. They're so embedded, like, you know, Obama, a black man, the first black president, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot to be him in his policies, whether it was the, the drones. I mean, I, you know, there's other very problematic things that have come up, since, you know, since his, his book came out. And it's just like, you know, it's it's the systems. It's it, this, these things don't live within just individuals, but they've been ingrained into our, our you know, the way things operate. Um, and so. We have we have you know a big task ahead of us to to bring bring these systems down and to really change them and to bring about change and you know historically Washington D.C. and, and government are the last to respond right like yeah. movements, right yeah. it forces they they catch up to us yeah. and so while you know it's it's defeating to hear these 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 individuals say things like that right let you know let's not pin our our hopes and dreams and aspirations and our work on them. Right. And I think for a lot of activists, they don't. Um, right. It, it's a roadblock. Right. It, it would be very ideal if Obama could speak out and, and, and help. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, you know, that's the nature of being part of a, a struggle like this is that everything is stacked against you. It's really just your passion, your work, your community, right? The people in the streets, the grassroots organizing. And that's what's going to get get us through. And, you know, for, you, you know, for people, for me as, as, a, as a person, of faith as well you know just the faith you know like it's it's hard not to feel defeated and overwhelmed right it's just like it just sometimes feels like it's just getting worse and worse right yeah. um you know, just a few days ago or again like i mean since george floyd and since he had had that like both of us can name so many names of, of people who were who were killed um and this isn't even talking about other systems of oppression right like we're not talking about uh you know the, poverty and homelessness and you know we're in in palestine about uh, occupation and all of these other things um and so i think you know i, I just think we we need to keep our, our heads you know down keep working together keep you know fighting these systems of oppression together um i really do i mean even just this conversation alone for me is like is, is a, it, it supercharges me right like i feed off of other people's energy right and it's like yeah like let's bring you know let's bring down these systems together and so i mean and 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 like you said edu education like for me so like reading like man there's so much to be learned about our history there's yeah. so much history that we don't know that we aren't taught you know that we aren't taught in schools that's right so there's a lot of catching up we have to do <laughs> i mean that's how i feel right like on some of these topics and it's like you know why, why weren't the why weren't these things taught to us or these mm -hmm. individuals celebrated and so yeah just just kind of keep doing what we're doing and 
and really um, try to find, you know, keep, um, keep, keep working together. I think the, the more we learn about each other's struggles, the more we feel like each other's struggles are our own struggle. Because yeah. I also don't want to be like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm in solidarity with you, right? No, like we are together in this. And right, wh while I might not be affected by it in the same way, I should be scared knowing that there's a system of oppression happening to one person in my country, right? Like that's so, right. Like, because they are they are tied together. And so, you know, the same the same company that's uh, you know built the wall for you know is, Israel is like the same one that's being uh, commissioned the Mexico and the U.S surveillance mm -hmm. systems like you said my own my own anoka my county sheriff went to train in, in israel on how to spot terrorism right like he went to israel to learn how to spot terrorism in the u.s <laughs> like, like in the world <laughs> right and so just like they're connecting we need to connect we need to organize we need to we need to push back absolutely no you're so right as i often say what happens over there is going to come to your neighborhood soon you know meaning that um, our foreign policy, our domestic policy, and our, for and our foreign policy, particularly in the U.S., is very much intertwined. And as we know, you know, with with Israel, um, the relationship that the United States has with Israel is very intertwined. So um, we need to keep watch on that. But other countries as well, because um, there's a lot going on right now in other places, and I know there's a lot going on here. But um, you know, there was a, there was an uprising in Nigeria that kind of just fell off the. It didn't. I mean, it was a blip on the on the corporate uh, media radar screen. I don't even know if it got talked about. But you know, these are the kinds of things that we all need to kind of pay attention to. And there is a lot to read. So I encourage people to read as much as they possibly can. And you know, perhaps we will be putting out a, a, a resource list of of books and things that people can can read um to to get them caught up on what has been and get them you know uh to to be able to carry the work forward well yep. um i think this is about the end of our session for today and i want to thank you for coming on and and talking to us about your experiences um this has been really really good and um or anything else that you'd like to say before we end? Uh, thank you for you know for for hosting this and um, you know I, I'm I'm excited. I know you said you went to to Palestine in uh, 2008, right? So yes. I hope that you know we can both uh, visit it together um, and Absolutely. that we can you know both uh, bask in, in the glory of liberation for both both of our people together. Absolutely. I, I, I look forward to the time when we can all come back and go back together and have a big party and, and, and celebrate the fact that um, we don't have to tiptoe going through anymore. So I hope so too. Well, thank you so much, Mariam. And thank you all for, for watching this, this session. Be on the lookout for other sessions as there will be other activists who will be sharing their stories. Thank you very much and have a good day.